Uh, hi, so here we are. Uh, I'm Stepan, my co-host is uh, Pavel, and uh, we're having a lot of fun uh, during the previous season of our podcasts. Uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, nice guests and uh, saw some really inspiring uh, works and uh, workspaces. But there was one uh, podcast we uh, haven't aired yet, and uh, because uh, it was uh, coronavirus, lockdown, uh, we had a lot of stuff to do, and then life happened, and then vacation st uh, started, so yeah, it was never aired, and uh, that was a podcast where Pavel decided to interview uh, yours truly. So uh, this episode will be aired now as the first episode of the second season of our podcast, and we have a great lineup of uh, future guests who will appear on our channel pretty soon so i hope you will like uh, all of that hi everyone we've also started to record short episodes where we talk to each other uh, and we talk about uh, smaller topics like uh, book markets or exhibitions uh, uh, we've both attended or a few interesting places uh, I visited in Moscow and uh, uh, will be uh, recording them this season and airing them as soon as they uh, come up. Yeah, and if any of you have any, any ideas, any recommendations uh, on what we should discuss uh, in these shorter episodes, uh, be our guests and uh, please leave some comments below. So now let's proceed with the older episode, uh, which will be the first episode of the second season of our iBook Bindings podcast. Enjoy. See you later. Hello. This is iBookBinding podcast. Today I'll be your host, and Stepan has been demoted to a guest, or is it promoted? Well, we'll see. Hello, Stepan. <laughs> Hi, Pavel. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, we decided it's high time to uh, make Stepan uh, talk about his uh, path. Uh, to where he is, because he has a lot, a lot to tell. Um, uh, he, his path has been a long one and somewhat tortuous, and I think this is uh, where we should start at the beginning. Yeah. How did you start? Yeah. Uh, you mean in general <laughs> when I was born or <laughs> with bookbinding? <laughs> well, most of us were born at some point, but uh, <laughs> very, very few of us. Uh, have ever started bookbinding. It is, yeah, yeah. It's an unusual thing. How did you become interested in it? When was it, first of all? It was a bit more than 12 years ago. It was uh, end of uh, 2007. I understand that I was searching for some, uh, you know, something new uh, in my life because I was a computer technician. I was uh, working for different uh, magazines as an editor, as a journalist, as a manager. And uh, yeah, but the, the, the worst was uh, uh, the part of my life when I was a sales manager uh, in a tech company. And it was definitely the worst because uh, I, I was uh, selling a lot of uh, IT stuff and uh, uh, I almost never saw this stuff. So it was uh, sort of moving around virtual things and uh, it felt absolutely, I don't know, unproductive or something. So at some point of time, I decided I, I, want, I need to search for something more material. And I guess uh, that's how bookbinding came to my life. And uh, uh, coincidentally, uh, almost at the same time, I started my business uh, uh, with uh, selling board games. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I find uh, this particular path very surprising because uh, in terms of education, most of your life you were preparing to become a programmer or something IT related. I can understand the, <laughs> the business bit. Your father uh, is a successful businessman. Well, yeah. uh, that I can understand. But how come uh, did you start doing something with your hands? Uh, were you crafty before that? Were there any hobbies that involved actually doing something, actually making something? I guess as uh, all, all Soviet boys, uh, I had my share of uh, crafts uh, education in the school. So uh, there was that. And, and I liked it. 
but then uh, I think most of my skills come from my uh, paternal grandfather. We spent a lot of time on his uh, dacha, uh, making some things with wood and uh, using power tools. And he taught me a lot I know now. And uh, he, he showed me lots of uh, tricks uh, and small things that uh, make your uh, woodworking life so much easier and not, not only woodworking life but ju just working with tools and uh, then he passed uh, many of his tools uh, to me so uh, yeah I, I definitely feel his heritage in my work and in my workplace almost every day but in terms of hobby and nothing preceded bookbinding you want like uh, uh, carving or um, no no. Uh, so, um, so, so how did it start? Why bookbinding? Was it an accident or was it something? Did you try other things? Or? Well, I, I definitely had some, some hobbies, but uh, they were not, not so craftsy, I guess. And uh, what was the project with which uh, uh, my uh, bookbinding hobby started? It was a, a notebook for, for a friend. So I, I decided to make a present for a friend, and uh, then I started to research. And uh, yeah, uh, I showed this book uh, uh, last time we talked with uh, Imgir, and uh, that's my first tutorial. And uh, I, I found an, an inscription in it. Uh, so it was bought in 2006. So it was a year earlier. So I was thinking about this for, for some time. It was. Uh, sort of fermenting in my mind for, for, for a year or so before I, I, I really started making books. And uh, then, uh, yeah, then I decided to make this first uh, journal, notebook, and uh, then the second one, then the third one, and uh, yeah, it just went off like that. <laughs> but your interest in books as objects uh, runs deeper. Uh, as long as I know you, you've been buying books almost obsessively. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess I guess a bit too much books. <laughs> yeah, definitely something that uh, uh, runs uh, through both sides of my family because uh, both both of my uh, grandfathers and grandmothers uh, had uh, extensive book collections, uh, uh, modern books, classic books, uh, uh, theme books. Uh, I don't know. My grandfather had a huge collection of uh, books dedicated to the uh, um, patriotic war. And uh, my maternal grandfather, of course, had a lot of books uh, uh, on philosophy because he was uh, a philosophy professor in multiple languages, not only in his native Romanian, but in many other languages as well. Um, so, yeah, I grew up with, with a lot of books in, around me, and uh, I feel strange when. I don't see books in, in an apartment. <laughs> well, we've all seen this meme. If you've uh, 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 come to somebody's home and they don't have book, don't see them. Uh, <laughs> I'll have to cut this out. <laughs> <laughs> or, or bleep this out. <laughs> okay, but still, I come from a bookish family too, but... Uh, uh, from what I remember about myself, I've never thought of books as objects. Uh, they were always yeah. a source of knowledge for me. I've, I've always been fascinated with libraries, but as a collection of texts and pictures, yeah. and not so much as, yeah. uh, 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 as collections of objects. When did you start to appreciate uh, a well-made book? Was it before you started uh, bookbinding, or only when you started looking at books as a product of somebody else's labor and craft, did you start noticing? Well, I, I always appreciated nice book design, and uh, I, I knew that uh, there are uh, handmade books and uh, books that are we uh, that have designs um, made by hand by by some masters. But I don't think I, I really saw a lot of them uh, besides, you know, in museums. I never had any leather-bound books uh, uh, at my home or, or neither had my grandfather. Well, maybe 
No, I don't think they had any, any design bindings uh, at, in their collections. Uh, so yeah, I started to look spe specifically for books like that. So already after I, I started making books, when I when I wanted to you know to find better ways to to make books and find ways to improve my skills. Mm. Perhaps we can move on to the uh, second stage, because knowing you, it couldn't have taken long before you started making money of your hobby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How, did, yeah, how did that start? Was it uh, teaching? Was it making books? Was it repairing books? What started you off in this business? So I think it was 2014 when I started teaching bookbinding. So it was uh, almost seven years after after I started making books. Uh, but my first uh, income from bookbinding was in 2008. So uh, it was pretty fast. It helped a lot that I'm pretty meticulous when when it's about uh, you know small things, making small things perfect, and and I like to to be. Uh, when I'm when I'm woodworking or, or when I'm making book, I try to make everything look the best, and uh, it was right from the beginning. Even even without any any skills at all, I I still tried to make my best, and uh, uh, pretty soon some people around me started to notice that, and uh, I got some of my first orders. And uh, of course now these books, well, maybe two of my first orders. I wouldn't say I would sell them now, or I would take any money for them now. <laughs> but starting with the uh, third project, when I was reckless enough to to start buying leather, uh, like in, in proper hides, uh, I, I started to. Well, my work was pretty nice at that moment, <laughs> considering that I, I wasn't I wasn't doing book buying for for quite a long time. <laughs> I remember by uh, 2010, uh, when I ordered my only book I've ever ordered from you, they were pretty yeah. uh, uh, they were pretty spectacular, and even more impressively, you could make a, bi uh, a big binding in just a few days. I remember it was a book uh, I ordered for my father, it was a big uh, collection of maps. I really enjoyed the whole process, because I remember we went to buy the leather, uh, you asked me about, about what, what I want, and then in just a few days, when it wasn't properly ready yet, so I gave, yeah. it, uh, I gave it as a present, and they put it under, uh, under a press, <laughs> but it uh, kept really well. It's still being, uh, uh, being used regularly, and thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, it's it's nice nice to hear that uh, ten years later there are <laughs> some books of mine <laughs> that are still used and uh, still survived at the time. <laughs> that's that's yeah, that's something. Yeah, I, I remember it was a pretty fast project and I I had not much time to do it, but uh, really uh, for for many bookbinding projects uh, uh, there is you you can you can. Uh, Make many bookbinding projects in in under one week and uh, even in uh, in just uh, two or three days. Uh, and uh, the the most uh, lengthy uh, part uh, is uh, waiting for for the glue to dry because uh, on every stage uh, uh, it it should better be drying for for a day or two because otherwise there is a chance uh, that uh, something will bend, covers will uh, will bend or the uh, the spine will shift or something like that. So uh, yeah, there may be a lot of problems uh, uh, because the glue isn't uh, dry yet. But then yeah, I just had to give that book to you, and uh, you were smart enough to <laughs> follow the recommendations and <laughs> keep the book uh, in drying for for several days. So yeah. Uh, was it just uh, the book binding that you started uh, doing right away, or sewing uh, the uh, the book too? I mean, uh, making the uh, the paper block. Uh, it, it, yeah. seems to, it seems to have come somewhat later. I think you started with uh, bindings for uh, printed books, and then you st uh, st uh, st uh, started sewing. Am I right? No, no, no. My my first projects were uh, were hand sewn right from the from the beginning. 
So uh, one of my first books was a, a notebook, as I said, and I, I printed some uh, uh, sheets uh, I downloaded from internet. Uh, I have sewn them, I cut them, and I and I uh, put them in, in the, into cover. So it was case by name. Second book was a collection of, uh, I think it was second or third book. It was a collection of uh, articles uh, written by my uncle, uh, who is a journalist and uh, play, playwright. Uh, so yeah, I prepared the, this uh, as a gift uh, to him. So yeah, some of my first books were uh, uh, printed and uh, sewn by me, and only I think only only by summer of uh, 2018 I moved to covering books uh, that are mass produced, and it was a set of Harry Potter books that, that I made, made in green leather. That's an impressive set. Is it still in Moscow? Yeah. Uh, no, it's 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 here with me. I I, I showed it uh, during one of the previous podcasts when we talked. I think when we talked with Ben Elbel. So I definitely see some errors in in uh, in these books. Well, a lot of errors in these books, and uh, uh, many things I would have done differently. Not even just better or more, you know, more precise. Just differently, and uh, it would be easier for me to to make the same work and faster and. Uh, and it would be a better work. So you definitely can see the path I took in, in these uh, six or eight months uh, uh, since I first uh, started bookbinding. Can you be, uh, perhaps uh, talk about uh, a bit more about that? So in terms of technology, how did it progress? Surely you, uh, your bookbindings weren't as complex as uh, the most accomplished of your books. Uh, or did you start making all the elements uh, of the book binding, say uh, the, the cords that you can see through the leather on the spine, yeah. all the end bands that you talk so much about. I mean, <laughs> hardly anyone notices, but when you point it, they are impressive. But still, this must have come at a later point. I definitely have a fixation on end bands, that's, that's true. <laughs> well, with every next project, you know, I uh, visited a lecture by some of uh, uh, of the chiefs of uh, Pixar several years ago, and uh, he talked that uh, he talked about uh, different projects and uh, about their uh, approach to every next uh, movie they make. Uh, uh, with every next movie, they they take a new technology they want to develop and uh, they implement it uh, for this movie. So every next movie is better in some way than the previous one. So, not 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 that I'm like Pixar. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I need to do a lot a lot of things to become you know Pixar book finding or something. <laughs> but uh, I definitely uh, use the same approach. And with every next uh, of my projects, I try to find something new to accomplish, something new to learn. And uh, uh, at that moment, by by summer of uh, 2008, I not only had uh, this. Uh, uh, also, the tutorial uh, for bookbinders or for bookbinding teachers. Uh, I uh, I ordered some books from uh, from Amazon from the United States. So I had uh, some uh, some more tutorials, and I tried to follow the projects that uh, were described in these uh, 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 books. So yeah, it was sort of uh, two way uh, street because I tried to find to invent some new projects for me to to improve my skills, and then I read books and tried and uh, sort of uh, projects came came out to me out of these books uh, with the, the new things I read, so, yeah. Speaking of learning, uh, from what I've just said, uh, one might have thought that you're entirely self-taught, but there was a moment when you went to a very exciting bookbinding school. Could you, yeah. uh, could you talk about that experience a bit? It was uh, a lot later. It was in 2015. It was already after I started teaching bookbinding, and uh, that that was exactly the reason I decided to to study because uh, I was able to teach quite well, and I was quite happy with the results uh, my students had, and they were happy with their results. So everything was good. But I understood that uh, uh, I need to be sort of sure in my abilities, capabilities, and my craft. So I decided that I need to find some, some teachers, some mentors for me, and uh, to improve my skills. 
and uh, I went to to United States to Colorado to uh, American uh, Academy of Bookbinding and uh, uh, what's what's funny is that uh, uh, first thing I, I tried to look for schools in Moscow and uh, there are some some options but some of them are uh, uh, have, have have different limitations for example they are uh, there are courses for librarians or something. So if you don't have a specific uh, uh, career or education, you just cannot enroll. And then there was a bookbinding studio that's called uh, Raritet, Rarity. And uh, uh, they make design bindings, they make uh, editions, and uh, they make very expensive bindings. And uh, uh, they, they also had courses, I don't know uh, what about now, but uh, when I compared, it was something like I had to pay uh, $5,000 for a monthly course, uh, for, for one month course in, in uh, this uh, uh, school in Moscow. And uh, in, in the United States, it was something like $800 per week. So I, I covered my airfare, uh, my uh, tuition, and uh, part of my uh, living there. And then I got a scholarship from American Academy of Bookbinding. So, uh, sort of, most of my uh, uh, expenses, uh, my expense in the end, my expenses were less compared to uh, this uh, school in Moscow. <laughs> but still, uh, why go there and not uh, to one of the old bookbinding centers in Europe? Why not Germany? Why not the Netherlands? In in Europe, many locations they are teaching in in their native language. So, uh, for example. There is a school, Ascona school in, in Switzerland, and I understand that they teach in, in um, multiple languages. Uh, but I think it was more expensive. Uh, so it was either the language gap or the uh, price. So in many cases, it was more expensive to go to study to Europe than to, to fly to the United States. It's sort of counterintuitive because uh, you have to fly further, and the uh, United States is not, not the cheapest country. But yeah, I, I, I compared something like 10 options, uh, including this one in Moscow. And in the end, uh, it seemed to me that uh, uh, American Academy of Bookbinding was the, the, the best. And uh, yeah, of course, the, the choice of courses was important to me because I, I found two courses I wanted to take. One, one was uh, a course uh, dedicated to box making. And the second one was uh, uh, leather binding. Uh, fine binding and uh, so yeah it was it was perfect mesh because they were going just one after another and uh, uh, perhaps we can talk about your teacher yeah yeah location of course location <laughs> <laughs> when I saw photos from Telluride I was like yeah sure <laughs> I'm going <laughs> because it's it's such an amazing place and uh, I, I traveled quite a lot through United States and uh, uh, I think I counted at some uh, uh, moment and I, I visited something like 35 say, states or, or something like that. So I guess that's uh, that's many more than uh, average American visits <laughs> throughout <laughs> their life. <laughs> the first time I was in the United States was in, in 1991. It was uh, uh, Soviet Union then, uh, still Soviet Union. So. Uh, and uh, But uh, since 2015, I think that uh, Colorado probably is one of the best states in the United States. What was your experience in the school like? Who were your teachers? What did you learn? Uh, so uh, my first teacher was uh, uh, Peter Jarty, and uh, uh, he, he taught us uh, box making. And uh, my second teacher was uh, uh, Don Glaster. Uh, he taught us uh, fine binding or French binding. Uh, Peter Jarrett is, is a professional bookbinder uh, for, for many years, and he's, he's a highly skilled bookbinding master. Uh, Don Glaster is also a, a very high-level professional in bookbinding, and uh, he does a lot of uh, artists' uh, uh, bindings, design bindings, and uh, they, they have... Uh, very different styles, styles of uh, binding and uh, styles of teaching. 
uh, but I loved both courses and uh, uh, it was just an amazing experience and uh, it's just great when uh, when masters are ready to share their knowledge and uh, um, it was really like for most of the things they taught us uh, during these classes uh, I already knew and uh, so uh, but but attending these courses was good for me in at least two ways first it was a good repetition of uh, my old knowledge maybe some things i i forgot already or some things that i maybe did not in the most efficient or proper way and the second was one was that uh, they shared a lot of small tricks they uh, knew from their teachers or they found out during their careers and uh, both of both of them were making books for for many many years so they know a lot of these small tricks and uh, uh, i think uh, the thing i cherish uh, the most is exactly all these small tricks i learned from from them and uh, so yeah it was it was an amazing experience and and this year i well we plan to move to united states this april and uh, uh, in the end of may i plan to to attend the course uh, uh that don glazer uh, was supposed to teach on box making and this july i i, I was planning to attend the course uh, by peter jerity on leather binding so they switched roles <laughs> but as, as you can imagine uh this course was well, this course was cancelled and uh, uh in the end the american academy of Painting decided that uh, they are cancelling all of the courses this year not only the spring and summer uh, semesters, uh, semesters, but also uh, autumn semester as well. And uh, I think it's it, it would be proper to say that uh, they are planning uh, some uh, uh, distance courses for uh, distance learning courses for this uh, autumn. So if anybody is interested, uh, check their website. They they will. I think they will announce something pretty soon. Okay, I, th I thought now we could talk about uh, some of your projects. Among all the books you, uh, you've made, is, is there any one in particular that uh, uh, you think is, uh, was the most complicated or the most fulfilling? What springs to mind when you think over your career? Um, well, there, there were a lot of uh, difficult books and uh, there were some difficulties with books as well. and. Uh, 99% of my books were made quite well, but uh, I guess the most difficult book for me was the one I, I didn't make properly and uh, the client was disappointed. It wasn't difficult, you know, because it was a, a tough project. It was difficult because uh, I sort of bear this memory with me throughout all these years and uh, I'm very disappointed in my work and in, in, in myself and in, in that I could have, you know, negotiated and asked for my much more time, or you know, made something. But I decided that okay, it, it, it's it's fine, and it wasn't fine. And uh, uh, but at the same time, it was a good learning opportunity for me, and uh, I think I never made this mistake again <laughs> since you know 2010 or something. So uh, it was. The most emotionally difficult book for me. The most uh, uh, technically difficult for me was uh, uh, a Talmud I had to repair several years ago, and uh, I agreed on some, uh, uh, you know, basic fee for for the repairs because it, it, originally I thought it would be only only uh, rebacking, so uh, it uh, I I only had to uh, take away the cover, repair it, and uh, put it back. Uh, but then it appeared that I had to completely disassemble the book, uh, repair uh, dozens of pages, uh, wash them, uh, dry them, uh, mend them, and uh, it took something like uh, 120 hours for me to uh, finish the book. And in the end, I, I, I spent half a year on this project and uh, the client was... Uh, uh, I think he was a bit unhappy because it took so long and uh, I, I didn't charge him at all because I didn't feel like charging the original amount was fair to me and uh, asking, you know, 
proper amount for 120 hours of work or something uh, was uh, uh, fair or something. And it was a book that was like like this thick. Well, Talmud is a big book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and of course, uh, in between uh, these two projects, there were a lot of uh, uh, fulfilling and amazing and beautiful projects. I made some simple leather bindings that still uh, I, I loved a lot because they were just, you know, so streamlined and, uh, and just uh, nicely done. Not to, you know, <laughs> boast too much, but <laughs> yeah, they were well done. Or some uh, uh, other things, uh, uh, yeah some uh, some books with uh, leather inlays for example maybe they are not perfect because uh, i don't know they were the the inlays weren't positioned perfectly but i still love them because uh, they mean something to me and uh, i remember how i was making them and i was learning different things i don't know leather inlays uh coloring leathers uh, uh working with different materials so yeah by different materials, you mean what exactly? I I mean uh, using, uh, of course, leathers, different types of paper, woods, uh, plastics. Uh, I, I experimented with uh, different stuff, but I think uh, the most uh, sort of bizarre projects I made, uh, it was a, a photo album that I made for, for, for my uh, uh, friend for, for her wedding. And uh, uh, the... The album was just just a leather binding. It was nothing super special. It was it was nicely done, but it, it wasn't too special. But the special thing about it was that I embedded a flash drive inside of the cover. So uh, the idea was that uh, uh, the paper or the, the photos were made with digital cameras, and then they were printed and put into the uh, uh, photo album. But you also had an uh, an option to have a digital. Uh, copies of these books in the, in, stored in the same album uh, for future use, and uh, yeah, it was a fun, funny project. I, I tried to sort of uh, improve on this idea over the years, but uh, never really found time to uh, finalize it. Uh, that, that's <laughs> interesting because otherwise, what comes uh, to mind when I think about your work is. Uh, following traditions uh, right from the beginning you were making very traditional books uh, is it something uh, you find particularly appealing or do you think that like inga who we talked to last time do you think that there isn't much to improve well uh i i don't want to say that i don't agree with inga <laughs> but i have a a bit different uh, attitude uh, uh, on this matter. And uh, I, I definitely see that uh, uh, every year there is innovation in bookbinding. And bookbinding isn't only about uh, traditions of uh, 17th, 18th, and uh, 19th century. Uh, there are many things that are interesting. In, uh, and that's one of the topics we discussed with uh, Ben Elbel, because Ben uh, invents a lot. In, in, in the area of bookbinding, and he loves this process of uh, inventing new book structures. And some of them are uh, not, not just funny ideas, they are really useful for, for, for in, in different uh, you know, situations. Uh, I, lo I like traditional bindings. I like uh, things like uh, Coptic, Coptic, Coptic binding, which is supposed to be the oldest uh, uh, bookbinding style we know of. And uh, and not only you know the uh, the simplistic Coptic binding that is usually made by uh, many hobbies because it's it's really simple structure, but uh, with all the additional you know things like end bands, <laughs> Coptic end bands, or or uh, you know uh, covering the covers with a leather or something. So uh, yeah, I like traditions and I. I try to educate myself uh, on on traditions, and uh, uh, but at the same time, I like new structures. So I like to see innovation in bookbinding. And what I don't really like, by the way, is this 
over decorated uh, uh, I think 17th 18th century gold tooled binding style which is still replicated by uh, some book binders these days and I think it sort of it had it it had its place 200 years ago and we can just let it go now I don't say that nobody should uh, should do that it's just something I, I wouldn't consider doing myself because I, I don't like it. And of course, there are people who like it and yeah, sure, I if you like it. 200 years ago, perhaps it seemed elevated. Today, it seems mostly in the voice. Well, uh, I, 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 I wouldn't uh, you know, put labels on it because once again, there are, there are some people who, who like this style and there are some amazing bookbinders who work in this style and and from technical point of view they do amazing work because uh, it, gold tooling is is not an easy process and uh, to make uh, even good not not even perfect but just good gold tooling project is uh, a lot of skill a lot of work a lot of testing a lot of trying so i i know how much work goes into projects like that but it's just something that's I don't feel, uh, you know, relatable for me. That's that's it. Uh, I, uh, uh, <laughs> Perhaps uh, we can talk a bit about your tools and your tool making because uh, for you, bookbinding was a uh, was a uh, segue to uh, yeah, ga gateway drug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to other crafts because uh, very soon you started making your own tools, and it was first yeah. uh, 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 woodcraft, and uh, then you started three D printing. How did yeah. how did that happen? Uh, weren't you satisfied with the tools you could buy, or was it just uh, uh, an idea that you can make everything. If you can make a book, you can also make a tool to make a book. <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess both. <laughs> of course, I I, uh, I like to make uh, things with my hands, and uh, even while I uh, didn't have any any handcraft hobbies for for many years since my childhood, I I still like the process, and and I like the moment when you can touch the result of, of your work and you can feel it and you can use it to make something else or you can give it to somebody else. And as I said before, this was one of the reasons why I didn't like this uh, sales uh, uh, job uh, uh, was selling virtual IT stuff. <laughs> not, not virtual, but virtual for me because I, I, I even didn't have a chance to, you know, to, to see the uh, solutions I, I've been selling. Uh, so uh, yeah, it, it seemed logical, and uh, really, I uh, my first uh, book press uh, I, I made it uh, myself uh, on my own with just uh, two planks and uh, uh, some screws and uh, something. So uh, I made it uh, right after I. I think maybe I made it even before. I need to check photos because I have photos of my first bookbinding projects and. Uh, uh, I think I made it even before I started making my first book. Yeah, because once again I had this, I had this uh, Soviet tutorial, and uh, there were some sketches of uh, tools, and uh, I understood that uh, to make a book properly, I, I at least need a press, and I I, I sort of uh, made a press that served for me as uh, as a, as an edge for uh, cutting uh, book edges, so I I. I uh, 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 it was uh, it, it, it served as a guide for for a knife when you are cutting a uh, book edge, uh, trimming book edge. I drilled holes through the planks, so it, it served as a sewing frame as well. So it was three in one, and just two planks, you know, and two screws. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, as for making tools sort of professionally, it took me many years before I started doing that, and. Uh, uh, I think uh, the trigger for me was uh, 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 my bookbinding courses, my bookbinding classes I taught. Because starting with my first uh, class, I decided that to bring more value to my students, I I wanted to give give them some tool they can use uh, uh, in their bookbinding projects. So 
uh, for something like two years, uh, every one of my students got a sewing frame uh, during the class. They, they took away home. So, uh, yeah, and right away from the beginning, I had to make something like uh, 10 sewing frames for my first class. So it was uh, almost industrial level production from the, <laughs> right, right from the beginning. And then you moved on to smaller tools, more specialized tools. I think it was a year and a half later. I bought my first 3D printer in, uh, I think it was 2016. Yeah, probably. I don't remember for sure, but yeah, it was it was a bit later, and uh, uh, I told my wife that uh, of course that's the thing I want to use for for my work. I want to to print tools, but yeah, generally I, I just wanted a new toy. And uh, uh, but when this toy arrived and I, I played with it for for a couple of months, I understood that. Uh, in reality, I can use it to, to produce some tools. And uh, uh, one of my first experiments was this uh, uh, corner cutting jig. Yeah. I maybe even have uh, older versions, not the best quality here. But yeah, the corner cutting jigs are used to trim away corners uh, uh, of your turning material so that uh, when you turn it in, uh, they, they meet flawlessly and uh, there is no no step under your uh, end end leaves and uh, yeah it makes book better it makes yeah it, it can help making book perfect i guess <laughs> yeah but uh the the reason i i decided to make this tool was because at, at that time i was teaching um uh, kids on on a weekly basis teaching kids book binding it was an amazing experience. I was so afraid the, the first time I, I had to uh, teach uh, uh, kids because they wouldn't listen to me. They would, uh, you know, they wouldn't behave. I imagined so many problems that could happen uh, during the class and uh, it was all the opposite. They were intrigued. They were listening to me with much more attention than uh, adults are listening, uh, were listening to me during my classes. And uh, they tried to do their best, not just, you know, I'll do it and uh, it's okay. And it was such an amazing experience. I, I was teaching uh, kids for something like a year and I guess this was uh, uh, the best teaching experience of my life. And uh, uh, the ages were from seven to 14. I guess 14 was, was the most problematic age, but uh, yeah, I, I had almost no problems with, with any of the kids that came to these uh, um, workshops. So I, I decided to make these uh, corner cutting tools uh, for these classes because I just didn't want the uh, kids to cut uh, their fingers off. But it did uh, progress fast from there. Your first 3D printer <laughs> was a toy, I remember it. Yeah. I will show it a bit later because I still have it. It doesn't work, but I still have it. <laughs> so 3D printers. Your first 3D printer was a toy. Yeah. Uh, your second 3D printer was a somewhat better uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. tool. Your, your third 3D printer you could reliably print uh, many, many orders on. And now uh, yeah. you have two or three at the same time, you're planning to buy, as usual, a few more. <laughs> What's the situation now? Yeah, I, I, at the moment I have... Uh, I need to count them. <laughs> I have seven uh, uh, that are supposed to be operational, and uh, out of these seven, only four are uh, working currently. Uh, one of them needs some small repairs and two of them needs need major repairs and uh the se my my second printer you mentioned uh, before it was damaged when we moved to the netherlands so its frame was broken and uh, only a couple of months ago i i finally found time to uh, reprint with the larger printer print uh, the frame for the smaller printer <laughs> and uh, now i'm uh, trying to uh to make it uh, print with paper pulp so I can make some, uh, I don't know. I've experimented with, um, 
with shipping forms that you know that uh, make uh, uh, that protects items when you send them uh, in in packages or boxes. Uh, so I made some forms like that, and then I decided that it may be easier for me to 3D print them. So I, I wanted to make a, a printer that uh, prints with a paper pulp. Yeah. Then this year came, and uh, I just didn't have any time to uh, move forward with this project. I have all the parts. I I know what I have to do. I just need to sort of uh, assemble it and experiment a bit more, but uh, uh, yeah. And uh, the four operational printers, are they working all the time? Are you like printing 24-7? Why do you need four, in other words? Uh, there are different reasons for that. Uh, first, they're of different sizes. And two more that are waiting uh, for for repairs. One of them is is, in, is printing in two colors, and the, the other one is printing in three colors. And they can uh, mix the colors, so you can you can even do some multicolor printing. I had a really busy time this April and May. I had quite a lot of orders, and these months, I guess, they were uh, the busiest uh, months for me in in a very long time since I have uh, since I had the. Uh, uh, my uh, uh, board game business. Why do you think that is? People uh, uh, have lots and lots of time on their hands and they buy book binding tools? Well, it, it, it started before the lockdowns. I, I introduced uh, some uh, new tools and some new versions of tools uh, this year. And uh, some of them appear to be quite popular. I started to get more and more orders. And uh, at, at some moments, uh, well, not at some moments, for something like uh, two months in a row since mid-March, uh, maybe early March, uh, and uh, to mid-May. May. At, at that moment, I had uh, uh, five printers operational, and they were printing 24-7, yeah. And uh, now, now I'm sort of uh, stockpiling, so I, I print some things in advance that are quite popular, and I, I just uh, try to have uh, uh, some some in stock so that when uh, usually I have in my Etsy shop I have uh, uh, for for some of the items uh, the terms of uh, production are one to two weeks for some of the items are two to three weeks so after the order comes I uh, I take uh, up to three weeks for uh, production and processing of the order and uh, that's just that's just it because i have i have a printing schedule and uh, in most cases i just cannot uh, put the uh, uh, put the uh, order into printing before uh, one or two weeks passes and uh, now it's 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 a bit easier because uh, maybe uh, i don't know i don't know exactly the reason i, I have some guesses uh, but uh, uh, this uh, Past uh, week, uh, I don't know, ten days since June started, I have a bit less orders than uh, than in spring, and uh, of course I'm I'm a bit upset because yeah, who 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 doesn't want to make more money? But then I'm finally able to uh, to take a bit of rest and to finally uh, close all the leftover orders that's. Uh, uh, shifted from from May, and uh, there were some orders that were waiting for materials for quite a long time. So for example, some orders uh, that I made with uh, wood and plexiglass presses, sewing frames, book scanning frames, and and such. And uh, uh, I just uh, didn't have opportunity to get materials in time because uh, by the beginning of May, all uh, uh, clear plexiglass. Ended in in the Netherlands. There were no one supplier who who was able to deliver a plexiglass because all of the plexiglass was was used for uh, making uh, safety screens or uh, protective gear or something like that. And uh, same was with wood, not because uh, wood was used for some uh, safety measures, just because all the deliveries took much much longer. And uh, for example, uh, usually I can. Uh, I can receive uh, materials in in a day or two, and uh, in April it took uh, three or four weeks uh, for wooden materials to be delivered to me. So uh, there were delays because of uh, delays with deliveries. Then there were delays because when finally the materials were delivered, I had to 
make like five times more tools in the same period of time in in the same two or three weeks so uh, uh of course it wasn't possible i just i overworked i i worked for uh some weeks i worked uh, really seven days per week like 12 hour days work days and uh, uh in the end i understood that if i don't have uh, weekends i will just you know have some problems with my health uh pretty soon so uh i decided that i need to take a pause and uh, but yeah that meant that some projects were delivered uh, weeks later than uh, than they supposed to be delivered and uh, there are still a couple of uh, orders that uh, are finalized but they are not packed because packing also takes time so yeah it just delays lead to delays lead to delays <laughs> i'd like to say thanks to all of our patrons on patreon uh, there were uh, several new subscriptions in the past weeks and uh, uh, you will find names of all these wonderful people uh, on the end screen of the of this video many thanks to all of them and to all of the uh, previous patrons who, who continue to support iBook Binding. And you can also become our patron if you'd like to. So uh, we discussed this a bit uh, uh, after we talked with uh, uh, Katie uh, Savelyeva that uh, it would be nice to invite some, uh, some physicists uh, uh, who know some things about uh, uh, liquid flows and turbulences and all that stuff to, to discuss the physics uh, of uh, marbling and uh, maybe we will find somebody like that and uh, the other topic i'd like to cover is a uh, topic of uh, copyright because uh, many people do not know a thing about how copyright works and what what's allowed to use for example uh, are the are different designs allowed to be used uh, as uh, designs in your book covers so it can be a pretty important uh, topic for uh, bookbinders. Uh, but yeah, we'll see if, uh, if a person uh, that can cover this topic, one of these topics uh, uh, will be found in the upcoming weeks. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. See you next week.